Human beings naturally resist change. And as leaders and coaches, certainly, we need to be respectful of our natural resistance to change and not judge, but rather observe. You're listening to the Building a Coaching Culture podcast. If you need to compete and win in the 21st century labor market as an employer of choice, this podcast is for you. Each week, we share leadership development, coaching, and culture development insights from leading experts who are developing world-class cultures in their own organizations. And now, here's your host, J.R. Flatter. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's J.R. Flatter, Two Roads Leadership, here with my co-host, Lucas. Hello. This session, we wanted to talk about coaching across generations. Let's see, how many generations do we have in the workforce right now? We've got Gen Alpha. I call them double A. They're not quite in the workforce yet. They've only been born, what, 12 to 14 years. So they're adolescents. They're probably not in the workforce right now. Gen Z, which we have a few on our team. We work with and teach Gen Zs, 1996 to 2010. Millennials is your generation. You're at the tail end of that. 81 to 95, Gen X, 1965 to 1980, me, the baby boomers, 1946 to 1964, I'm at the tail end of that generation, but I think thoroughly ensconced in their traditions and the things they hold dear. Silent generation, maybe a few lingering folks from that generation, 1928 to 1945. Greatest generation. (laughs) My father falls in there. He's still around, thankfully, but retired many years ago. So really, we're looking at one, two, three, four, maybe five generations in the workforce that you and I are regularly coaching. I do have a coach who coaches Gen Zs and Gen AA's, uh, but not in a leadership or business focus, as you and I talk about. You know, it brings up an interesting thought, um, go off sideways just a little bit. You know, the adjectives that we put in front of our coaching, leadership coach, life coach, business coach, the fundamentals of coaching remain the same, irrespective of where you're focusing it. We have folks that call themselves DE&I coaches, life coaches, fitness coaches. They still engage with the same competencies that you and I engage, largely focused on leadership coaching, executive coaching. Yeah, you think about you know, a product category like headphones or something and how there's running headphones and studio headphones and all these different sorts of kinds, but they're all the same product category at the end of the day, you know? Yeah, that's interesting in bringing that up because at its most fundamental place, it's a product. And so what is the product? It's still the same, perhaps business fundamentals. And so coaching is pretty much the same way. We all have different product areas, and even the niche that you choose, the niche that you choose is just a refinement of the product. At the end of the day, it's still coaching. So whenever anybody puts an adjective in front of that, I just caution them, make sure you're sticking to the fundamentals. So what is different now here in the 21st century? I've talked to my millennial partner here. I was born deep into the 20th century, but spent four decades in the 20th century. You spent the latter half of one decade or maybe eight years of the last decade in the 20th century. So your most of your experiences are here in this 21st century, whereas most of my forming experiences were in the 20th century. What are some of the differences you see? So, I mean, I think my first thought is technology and how that affected just like adolescence and growing up. And so I'm thinking about slight time period before like high speed internet when I was a child and then high speed internet throughout until 2007 then the smartphone coming out and mobile internet right around when I was going to college so that time period where I was going to college just overnight nobody has a smartphone then everybody has a smartphone and and so just the experience of okay I'm you know an adult learning how this affects how people socialize and how people 
you know, even how people date each other and, you know, find friends, find communities. And so how that to me is kind of something that hasn't existed for my whole life, but it's very prevalent. So if you think about Gen Z, I'm, I'm imagining them, you know, smartphone, not when they were in college, but when they were, you know, 10 or younger. So, and even I'm looking at my own son, he's like way down the line past probably Gen AA, like you mentioned. But he was born, you know, with a cell phone in his hand, whether it's for entertainment or just messing with it when mom and dad aren't looking. But just the way that that kind of affects your experiences, because even you're writing a research paper, do you have the Internet? Do you have books? Do you have what tools are available to you? You know, AI is here now. Oh, yeah, sure. (laughs) That's really interesting because. I always thought you were a technology native and I was the technology immigrant. But now you're describing that even born in the 90s, you consider yourself somewhat of a technology immigrant. That's an interesting perspective I hadn't heard yet. Yeah, I mean, in the fact, in the sense that how much of your culture and like interaction with other people goes back to the technology. And I think like internet is probably you know, ingrained in in our generation, no matter how young of a millennial you are. But there's this aversion almost to the selfie taking like overly, oh, I have a meal and I'm going to take a picture of it. It is part of the millennials culture, but there's this slight self-consciousness to it. Whereas I think the younger generation, it's like an embracing of that and not a self-conscious feeling. And I think this is really relevant to what we're talking about because I'm discovering things about you that I've known you your whole life that I just assumed all this time. And in our coaching and certainly in our leadership, you know, we make those same assumptions. Uh, you tell a really funny story about the first time you did the get off my lawn scene and considered yourself for the first time ever, probably grown up for a long time, but consider yourself getting older for the very first time when you were scolding some young kids, I think it was outside of your hotel room or whatever it is. Then you realize, Oh my God, I'm becoming my dad or I'm becoming uh, like a boomer or you know, I'm yelling at kids for making too much noise. Part of my thinking about this whole intergenerational discussion is, is it a function of age or is it a function of generation or a combination of both? And then you weave in technologies. So, you know, like not to sound like too old of a person, but, you know, I grew up with, if you were lucky, three TV stations. And where I lived, oftentimes you had zero because there was no reception and certainly no cable. And then you matured to where you had cable TV, the technology matured and it became more widespread. And you get into the internet coming to life as I was coming to adulthood and just thinking and constantly trying to catch up, constantly trying to catch up. And now you're describing the same thing of Gen AA versus millennial, Gen Z versus millennial. So look, for me, it just continues to affirm we're all going through this. I suspect that in 10 years, Gen Zs are going to be telling stories about Gen AA's the way I told stories about millennials and it's actually, we found etchings on cave walls of the slothful youth of today are going to destroy everything. So I I do think there are some really big differences in generations, but also I think there's so many commonalities. I mean, partially even in like pop culture and, you know, books, movies, games, you see um, like these different eras happening where, okay, this big movie came out and then everything after it was informed by that. And that's how I've looked at it in the past, but those eras like happen concurrently to each other. So this particular creator is still making 90s movies in 2005, for example. And or, you know, even 80s movies in 2005, and and they're kind of going in parallel next to each other. And you even see it with, like, 
actors and groups of actors. Like there's lots of Gen X actors that are still in tons of popular movies like, you know, Brad Pitt, even Leonardo DiCaprio. Like you look at those and you think like, oh, those are people that were in their prime in like 2005 or so. And they're still in movies, but they're marketed for, you know, like you were saying, the age group. They're being marketed for people that are my age, not necessarily which generation they come from. I was also thinking um, like about, you know, something coming out and it being taken at face value. Like think about, oh, the Internet is a great thing because it can allow for communication. And then five years later, what is the internet doing to our communication that's not necessarily better? You know, so the kind of modernist and then postmodernist take, like something is introduced as this is the bottom line up front and then it gets examined five years later or a couple of years later. And so depending on how old you are, it might depend what attitude you're looking at the different aspects, you know? Yeah, I realized about 15 years ago that people stopped selling me things. Like if I watch a television commercial, nine times out of 10, they're not selling it to me. They're selling it to you. And, and so the, the market has moved on. I'm the target of a few products, but not widespread across the culture. Pull all of this back into the relevancy of coaching for a minute. And so we're a coach of a certain generation. So I'm the boomer coach or the millennial coach. We have Gen Z coaches. We have Gen X coaches. I'm sure sooner than later, we're going to have a Gen AA coach. And you and I were talking in our last session about ethics versus morality. And our moralities are different. Yet when I'm a coach, when I put my coaching hat on and I'm sitting in a coaching chair and I have a coaching mindset, I'm asked to push that morality aside and coach the leader in their morality. And so we need to be very cognizant across generations. Are we coaching the generation we're coaching or are we coaching our generation if they happen to be different? And if we're finding judgment, conflict, dissonance between what we believe and what the leader we're coaching believes, are we doing our absolute best to push that aside? and not allow it to influence our coaching. I mean, that's a high bar. That's a lot to ask of a human being. Yet it's essential to the success of a coaching relationship. Lots of times, maybe a common example is that one young person tells a joke that nobody else really understands or they don't think it's funny. And it's it could go back to that difference of perspective like, you're taking it at face value and and they're taking it at an ironic value because they don't have this same emotional attachment that you grew up with around it. So it's easy for them to make fun of certain things that you wouldn't want to make fun of. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know when I, I started my business at 39 years old and I have a few gray hairs, in that, but I certainly had no gray hair back then. And I was judged by that, right? Am I too young to be the CEO of a business? And you see a lot of very young CEOs now. If you ask me what are the differences between the 20th century and the 21st century, and I say these things completely without judgment, just as observations, there's a loyalty to self and profession rather than a loyalty to an organization. But I personally believe that's a very healthy thing It's a healthy thing on behalf of the individual for certain because the technologies and very much likely the profession that you're in isn't going to exist across the lifetime of your career. If you look at your son and he's five years old today. He just turned four, yeah. Oh, four. I'm off by your, I got 10 of them running around. By the time he's in the workforce, the technologies that are present are going to, we don't even know about them yet. AI by 20 years from now, when he's two years out of college, who knows what that's going to look like. And certainly from the time he starts to he finishes 40 years later, 50 years later, 
that technology is going to change again and again and again. I have a friend who tells a story about his grandfather working in the same profession in the same building for 50 years. Those days are gone. And so the work ethic of my father, the work morality of my father, joining an organization, staying there for 30 something years, retiring and receiving a pension, those days are gone. And they actually never were there because a lot of those pensions were not funded. And so the second the company went bankrupt, the pension evaporated. Now I live in a 401k life, right? Where I'm funding my own retirement. And I'm certain you are, and, and certainly Declan will fund his own retirement. And you know, what does that even mean 50 years from now? So human beings naturally resist change. And as leaders and coaches, certainly we need to be respectful of our natural resistance to change and not judge, but rather observe and comment on our observations. Yeah, I was joking with Lena, and I don't think this is going to get controversial, but just um, looking at Genesis and how they specifically mention um, that at this point, God let Adam name all the animals, right? So this is an elephant, and this is a cheetah, and this is a bear. I found it funny because it's like you have a new generation, and they don't believe anything you believe, but at the very least, like, let's call the animals the same thing. Let's establish this for all future generations that we're going to call it an elephant, you know? (laughs) So, yeah, like, there's some things that we you know, have to agree on language, communication. Um, But we take more things for granted than I think is actually the reality. So, like, I think that young people are coming with a much fresher slate than we realize, you know? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I've written policy for a living at one place in my life. And one of the things I learned writing policy was Say absolutely as little as you have to. Because everything you say, you take freedom away. And so if you write a dissertation on policy, you've taken all their freedom away. And human beings love to be free. So write as little as possible. Relevance to this is if you're writing policy for an organization, and certainly in intergenerational organizations, and ethics or policies, Write as little as possible. Have a very short list of ethics. And ask yourself, is everything I'm saying existential? And if it's not existential, you probably shouldn't say it. You and I work in the same company. We've known each other your whole life. And yet we're as different as night and day in so many ways. Because as your father and as the chairman of our company, I've tried to give you as much freedom as possible, but there were some non-negotiable items, education, family, that's it. I mean, not much more than that, right? How you wear your hair, how you dress, that's yours. I might go, well, that's interesting, (laughs) but it doesn't influence you and, and restrict you. Certainly as a coach, And certainly as a leader, you better be very thoughtful about what you tell people are important to you in your organization, especially in the 21st century. So an additional difference, uh, loyalty to self, loyalty to craft, and that craft is changing, is the gig economy and the virtual nature of work, the asynchronous virtual nature of work. Yeah, we need to be together for a certain number of hours in any given day so that you and I can do things like this, coordinate, cooperate. A lot of the day, we don't need to be in the same place, certainly not in the same place, and certainly not the same time of day. And so if you're setting the policies for an organization, you should be pretty thoughtful about what time you're asking me to show up, where you're asking me to show up, how you're asking me to dress. You know, I have a pet peeve with the F-bomb. A lot of people, that's just, you know, part of their language now. Um, Who's right or wrong? 
I think if you come into my boardroom and I ask you not to drop the F-bomb, that's probably not going too far. But in some other organizations, they would think that's absurd. And I get the freedom to decide whether I want to work with them. If I tell you you can't drop the F-bomb in my boardroom, you have the opportunity to vote with your feet if it's that important to you. But it's not existential. I mean, it makes me think about, you know, things that were non-negotiable that are, you know, now like kind of seen as normal. And I guess if if I were giving people advice, I might say, you know, don't get a tattoo past your sleeve or on your neck or on your face. And that's still pretty hard and fast, but just having tattoos in general or having long hair versus short hair, all those things are kind of like, you can kind of give advice and say like on average right now, maybe the government isn't going to want to hear the f palm for the next five to 10 years, you know? So it's a good policy for us because the government employees or government customer might hear us and then think, oh, that's, they don't align with our ethics. But I can't say in every room that you go into, you know, don't use that language just in this particular you know, environment. Yeah. You know, going back to this idea of loyalty across you know, between organization and person, I'm one of those people that thought uh, that thinks it never was there, and I don't. I don't want to appear cynical. We talk about the good old days, right? Well, in many ways, the good old days weren't. People were employees for life because of lack of opportunity, not lack of desire. My father worked in the same place for 33 years. There were a lot of negative aspects to his relationship with that organization, but they allowed him to raise his family. And we're one of the few steady jobs in our area. And he gutted it out. Had he had opportunity, do you think he would have gone elsewhere? Heck yeah. I, I think the good old days, there was a lot of that going on. That, that grandfather that worked 50 years in that same building, I can imagine him trudging up to that building for the 49th year and going, my God, I can't believe I'm still here. I see strength. I see freedom. I see really good things in the gig economy, in the freelance market, loyalty to self. At the heart of you know, whether you're a capitalist or not, I'm an unapologetic capitalist. And because I am, I won't apologize for that. Because I believe I create a lot of value in this world by doing that. Uh, but the, the heart of capitalism is every person for themselves, for their own interest. And look at the, the amazing value that's created. Yeah, I mean, I was talking about, you know, seeing cycles and you know earnestness versus ironic and but i also see cycles with like consolidation versus siloing and and that happens over and over and over and it's you know technology allows all these computer startups to pop up and then they get consolidated and so you have when you have the silos you have all this innovation coming from individuals and smaller organizations and then they get consolidated where they might not have the innovation, but they have the economics of scale to really push things forward. But at a certain point, the innovation's not there at all. So right now, I think, yeah, like what you're saying about the gig economy being so positive, well, having, you know, a thousand computer scientists all freelancing versus a thousand and one organization all working on the same application. I see the economic machine moving and in, in promoting that innovation in a way. Well, yeah. I mean, look at examples from our recent history, the space industry, you know, the commercialization of space has driven the technologies so far forward and so fast that it would be inconceivable to not have that decentralized. So allowing more freedom, whatever you want to say about the gig economy, whatever you want to say about freelancing, there's a reason the word free is in freelancing, because it's freedom to decide with whom you work, freedom to decide where you work, uh, freedom to decide what you call work. That's what the freelance gig economy is all about. To go back to the, you know who we're coaching, a lot of times we're coaching leaders. When you're talking to leaders and you're talking about growing a culture that attracts and retains the world's talent, you better think about having a 
culture that allows that kind of freedom. We're in a global labor market that is largely virtualized. It's becoming more freelance every day. You and I have employees all over the world. And the reason that they're all over the world is because that makes sense for our business. Now, there are some moral discussions that go along with some of the decisions about who we employ and to do what functions. But we're huge, I hope. We're demonstrating, communicating and demonstrating that we're proponents of the free market. We're proponents of freelancing. We're proponents of virtualization. And as coaches, we better certainly be willing and able to coach across those generations, across those cultures. So another common theme about intergenerations is our annoyance with them. I think, and I think you might think the same thing to a great extent, it's age versus generation that I'm annoyed with more than the generation itself. There's a classic saying, I think it comes from Mark Twain. When I was 17 years old, my father was so stupid, I could hardly stand to be around him. And by the time I turned 22, I was amazed how much he had learned in five years. Because now Twain was an adult, looking at his adult father where he was an adolescent, an elder adolescent, but nonetheless, an adolescent looking at an adult and judging that adult. And that goes on across all generations, and it happens in both directions. Twain was annoyed by his father, but I'm sure his father was annoyed by him. You're going to do what? You're going to write books for a living? How <laughs> about getting a real job? I always tell the story about Einstein, or you know, not Einstein, um, Edison inventing the light bulb, and it was the thousandth one that worked. And how annoyed people were, his wife, his children, his, his co-workers, hey, Tom, how'd it go to work today? Yeah, it didn't work again. <laughs> uh, but somebody had faith enough in him. He had faith enough in himself. And so, you know, do we have faith in ourselves as a coach to coach across those generations, enough confidence, enough efficacy? And do we have enough courage to accept different morals, different customs, different prioritizations? Yeah, I definitely identify with that feeling of frustration with a younger generation or just what is this music or what are what are they wearing or the humor like i don't understand <laughs> what kind of jokes they're making on the internet half the time and i think it's just that you said earlier like i'm not being sold to anymore and the secret handshake that i used to use is now like an indicator of how old i am not how young and cool i am <laughs> <laughs> Wearing socks with your sandals. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> or black socks and sandals. Yeah, it's funny how that works. But part of that annoyance is a very natural and a very healthy thing. And it goes back to the genetics of the human species. Our instincts tell us to be annoyed by our families so that we will move away from them and engage in lifelong relationships with people outside of our family, engage in childbirth and raising families outside of our own tribe. From a genetic perspective, it goes all the way back to the basics of genetic. We know that inbreeding is not healthy for the human species. When it's been done, it's had very negative consequences. So it's a very instinctive thing that we are annoyed by the elders and we're annoyed by the youth. But as we mature, hopefully we gain an appreciation of what that annoyance is all about and we learn how to work together. We did, uh, I had an opportunity to go out and speak at my alma mater, University of Washington, where I did my undergrad. And one of the seminars that I asked to do was, let's just all get in the same room, as many generations as we can find. And we had five generations in the room for three hours. And so we broke them into five groups with one generational representative in each group. And so they stayed in that group, but everybody else rotated. And so you had five conversations across three hours, across five generations. And we asked them at the end to write, you know, what was the one thing that they were taking away? And almost universally, they said, we are so much more alike than we are different. If we'll just sit and talk to each other for a few minutes, 
and uh, gain a perspective and an understanding and maybe even appreciation of why I think the way I think, why you think the way you think, why Declan thinks the way he thinks as he grows into a young man. Yeah, that was really eye-opening for, I suspected that would be the outcome, but certainly it was confirmed. There were 200 people in the auditorium. Yeah, what a powerful session that was. Any closing thoughts as we wrap up this wandering dialogue across generations? Well, I just said one thought about the like aversion and annoyance. I think maybe part of it that I identify with is this kind of like, in, and it is the, about the age. Like if I look at myself five years earlier, I think, oh, um, hubris, like, oh, this person didn't understand what they were supposed to understand. And, and now that I have this knowledge, I, I don't have that attitude anymore. But you don't necessarily do that with people that are your own age that are just completely different specializations. Like, you know, somebody that's a musician, I don't think, oh, how ignorant are they about computer science and and illustration or whatever. Um, But I might think that about a young person. Why didn't they spend more time learning about (laughs) this and this and this? Yeah, imagine me looking back 30 years of mistakes I made raising you and your siblings. Yeah, we don't have the knowledge today that we had then. And I don't say it's foolhardy to judge us on the same you see a lot of revisionist historians judging their predecessors. I think it's largely foolhardy to do that because no matter what picture you look at, you can even look at a video of an event. You weren't there. You didn't feel the fear they had, the anxieties they had, the smells, uh, the human to human contact that they were engaged in. Yeah, you're judging them 30 years later through an image, not even the actual event. And there's so many rounding errors across time and across interpretation. It's absolutely foolhardy to do that. And certainly as coaches, we shouldn't even begin to engage in revisionist history. That's why we look forward to grow. When we start looking back, it's really of little value from that context. All right, brother, thanks for your time. Well, that concludes this episode of Building a Coaching Culture. I truly hope that this episode was helpful to you. If it was, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe stop and give us a rating or a review and share this podcast with someone who might find it helpful as well. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.